everyone, and welcome to the Pash On Podcast. Let's get started with your host, Brian Pash. Hi, this is Brian Pash, and welcome to another podcast interview. On today's show, I have Aaron Bickert. He's the EVP and General Manager of Offer Logics. And today, we're going to do a deep dive into the current state of automotive retail, pricing, payments, incentives, and all powered by Offer Logic. Aaron, welcome to the show. Hey, Brian, thanks for having me. You know, it's always great to be on your podcast. Uh, you always bring out some great questions, and uh, and I'm here to answer them. Great. Well, let's let's start first, Aaron, by setting the context of Offer Logics. You are powering millions of payment calculations every month. You are powering payments behind the scenes on websites, digital retailing tools, customized digital marketing platforms, anywhere a payment is needed, uh, equity mining solutions. So for the most part, you're the Intel inside for advanced retailing. Did I summarize that right? Yeah, you summarize it probably better than anyone probably within our organization, probably including me. Um, I mean, you said it perfectly. Actually, what I want to do is probably record that and uh, put that down as my uh, elevator statement because that was actually beautiful. But the, <laughs> but the, at the end of the day, but yeah, so uh, yeah, we power, uh, you know, billions of payments, matter of fact, a month now, uh, as you know, as interest rates have been coming up over the last, uh, you know, last 45 to 60, 75 days or 90 days or whatever it is. Um, you know, pay, everyone now is shopping for payments and payments is the hottest, greatest thing. You know, I remember two, three years ago during COVID, no one wanted to shop by a payment. But uh, but now everyone is shopping by payment because, uh, as you know, interest rates are higher. So, Aaron, let's um, kind of peel back that onion on payments today. Um, we've seen a big swing in the last three years. It was a fear of inventory supply. Then it was selling cars at MSRP, then MSRP plus and now inventory on dealer lots for the most part is getting back higher and higher each quarter and now interest rates have have jumped significantly of course the same thing in the mortgage market so let's start from what you're seeing you're seeing these payments uh come through are you seeing more dealers like at a normal rate discounting vehicles or um, are we still seeing resistance to discounting at the dealer level we'll talk about oems yeah. later yeah, well, yeah so yeah so at the dealer level well it all depends on the oem and the brand of course uh it is uh, coming back it is normalizing the inventory of course now we have this strike uh you know for the th big three um you know stellantis ford and general motors but um, but the other, you know, imports, you know, depending on where you are, like Kia and Hyundai, uh, you know, we see inventory normalizing. Toyota's uh, starting to come back normalizing. We also have uh, uh, Honda normalizing. General Motors was definitely normalizing. Now with the strike, we don't know what's going to go on there. Stellantis has been normalized, believe it or not, for a long time, um, which which is unclear how that happened. Uh, and of course, uh, Ford uh, is was starting to become normalized too as well. And those are just basically the top seven in Nissan too as well. But, you know, we think about this, uh, dealerships now have inventory, so they don't want to pay their floor plan. And also competition uh, needs is starting to come, um, uh, you know, more competition for market share uh, within your own market, within your own market. So dealers need to discount the vehicles. Um but unfortunately, with interest rates uh, the way it is, they have to discount the vehicles even more because consumers are, you know, typically used to buying a car for four hundred and fifty-six dollars a payment or five hundred dollars a payment where it used to be, uh, and now you know the customers are now on average about seven hundred and forty-seven dollars a monthly payment uh, across the across all platforms, you know, from Highline to inexpensive cars. So we're seeing an average payment of about seven forty-seven right now. Mm. Uh, and, and about 16% of the dealerships, 16% uh, of the car sales that are out there, transactional sales, people have a over $1,000 a month payment, over $1,000 a month. Um, and we're seeing this in real time. I mean, if I ever walked you through my dashboard, um, you would be like, wow, this is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, so dealers have to definitely uh, start discounting vehicles, depending if you know what they have, of course. Uh, and um, 
they are discounted vehicles. Uh, you know, we work with one of the largest dealer groups in the United States, if not the largest dealer group in the United States. Uh, and uh, they're discounted vehicles like mad uh, just to get rid of vehicles so they can show a profit. Well, the floor planning dynamic comes back into play, right? Dealers had a two year break on floor planning costs. So, you know, we're going back to more of a historical model that turn rates uh, like folks like Jason Rice at Lot Pop help dealers mm -hmm. keep their turn turn rates um, active so that, you know, they can minimize that floor planning cost. Uh, I agree with you about Stellantis. You could tell that Stellantis inventory levels were getting back to normal because it, it wasn't, I'm not talking yesterday, it was maybe two months ago, I saw some Ram truck commercials uh, with like a 1.9, a really aggressive interest rate. And I was like, oh, uh, they must be sitting on a lot of trucks. That's a huge swing, Aaron, right? During COVID, there you couldn't find the truck under MSRP. Now uh, the Ram trucks are being highly incentivized for a new car purchase. What What's happening there? So I mean, Stellantis was actually more than two months ago, Brian. I mean, Stellantis was the very first ones coming out with uh, subvented rates as well as rebates uh, and specialized incentives. Uh, they've been doing it almost now, I would say almost a year. Uh, you know, I'm not, you know, don't hold me to the calendar for a year, but I would say approximately a year. Uh, Stellantis was the very first one to start doing because they were normalizing their inventory. Plus, they were trying to get more market share. As you know, the Dodge Ram wasn't selling as well as the Silverado and F-150. Uh, so as you know, they have only they're trying to sell more Rams, uh, but not only Rams, but they're trying to sell just the Jeep, the Jeep Wagoneer. Uh, you know, they're trying to sell the chargers. There's lots of different things sitting there that they need to sell. Um, but uh, they were the very first ones coming back uh, with the rebates and incentives. But the other piece of the puzzle, Brian, that a lot of people are not talking about that actually is that dealers are um, – not paying attention to, and some are, and some aren't, is remember the old stair step. Um, you right. know, you sell 10, I'm just making it up, but 10, 10 Dodge Rams, uh, you get nothing. But after 10, you get 250 to the next 30, you know, and then after 30, you get 500 or whatever it is. Um, they're coming out with new stair step products now. And I'm not saying Stellantis is or, or Nissan or whoever it is, but uh, there are a lot of uh, OEMs now coming out with stair step process uh, um, programs for the dealer. Uh, and matching the CSI. So if you have a good CSI and you sell a lot of cars, you get an extra $500 per car. Uh, we're seeing that a lot now on rate sheets and different programs that are being uh, incentivized uh, by the OEMs. Uh, so they're coming back strong. Uh, now the million dollar question is what's going to happen with the strike? So if they stay on strike, you know, 25 to 30 days, you know, what, what happens to the inventory level? Do they keep these subvented rates out? Do they keep these high rebates out uh, and so forth? So that's, that's going to be the million dollar question. You know, you bring up uh, a good point about Stellantis taking the, the lead. Obviously they had more inventory than others. Didn't mean all models were moving off their lots as quickly. So of course, we're getting back to rebates, incentives, floor planning costs. Uh, what I would say, uh, what automotive retail looked like before the pandemic. Um, with one twist, uh, you are the only platform that I know that provides EV incentives, tax breaks, uh, uh, the information that digital retailing tools, websites, and marketing tools need to properly show a payment on an EV. Yet, when I think of EVs, I have some Mercedes dealers in the country that are not on the West Coast or East Coast that are sitting on EVs. I was talking to a dealer in Pennsylvania the other day. Um, they're sitting on EVs, even though there is you know, maybe uh, a 4,000 or 7,000, I forget what the number is, you would know it, uh, incentive. <laughs> What's happening that even at those rates, Aaron, even with incentives, EVs are sitting on dealer lots? Well, you know, Brian, let's all, let's all take a step back for a second. I mean, it's just like anything that we do in life, right? Uh, you might be a Mac user. I might be a PC user. Some people might be an Apple Apple phone user. Some people might be an Android user, depending on the platform. So what happened really in life is two things. You got the early adopters that actually went out and bought all the EVs and everyone thought it was the greatest thing ever, number one. 
Number two is if you think about back in the day, you and I are about the same age, you know, and, you know, don't, you know, I'm not going to say that you are the same age as me, but, uh, <laughs> but, 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 you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm in my fifties and you're probably in your fifties. Uh, you know, I know you look a little younger than I do. Uh, you know, just I had a little harder life than you did growing <laughs> up. So, so, but, but at the end of the day, I mean, you think about it, you remember the VHS beta? Yeah. Right. Right. Well, think about this for a second. So you had the early adopters, right? They went out and they bought a Tesla and then they bought a Rivian or they bought a Ford Mach 3 or or whatever, they, you know, whatever it is uh, on the deal. Right. But now the problem is the infrastructure. So now you have VHS and beta. Right. So everybody back in the day was like, do you buy a beta machine or do you buy a VHS machine? One was made by Sony and VHS. The patent was done by JVC. If you remember JVC back in the day, That's well, right. when, you go, when you go get, when you want to go electrify your vehicle, electrify it, you like that? Electrify it. You want to charge it, right? You want to do it. Which, which, where do you go? Do you go to the Tesla charging stations or do you go to the other charging stations? And half the time you go to another charging station that doesn't accept char Tesla, char your, your car doesn't accept a Tesla charging network. Uh, it doesn't work. Right. You have to wait in line. You know, there's no overhang. It's raining out and you're charging your car with electric. Right. So number. So that's number two. So they got to get that correct. And you can see a lot of OEMs are now moving over to the Tesla network. Uh, number that's number two. Number three, if you think about that. Right. So you have the early adopters. You have the charging network that is not really good across the United States, uh, the infrastructure. And number number and number three, if you think about this, electric cars, everyone think, well, God, they're they're expensive, you know, and interest rates are high. How am I going to afford an electric vehicle? Right. You know, let's just say it's a fifty thousand dollar vehicle. How am I going to afford a fifty thousand vehicle? Most people don't earn that type of money. You know, at, you know, they have to buy a twenty five to forty thousand dollar vehicle in that range. Number number one. Number two is it does. It's not long range. Number two. So you might go only 200 miles or 250. You know, a typical tank of gas goes 400 and 450 miles. So that's once right. the battery gets to 400, 450, that's going to be the sweet spot. And number four, we're going to go back to the infrastructure. Look how many people now look how many people live in apartment buildings. Look how many people live in townhomes. Look how many people who live in just like, say, cond condominium complexes. How are you going to have all these charging systems across apartment buildings and condominium complexes? You're just going to have wires everywhere, right, sitting around? So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about that for a second. You know, you go down the street, you know, you live in Florida. There's lots of condominium complexes in That's Florida. That's right. And there's lots of apartment complexes in Florida. Can you imagine a charging station at every spot? um across or do you have to bring it out the patio window and down two flights of stairs to bring out your charging station outside from your kitchen uh, adapter you know i don't know how that's going to work so right and yeah what happens when you have a 30-story building <laughs> right. <laughs> right a 30-story building you know in miami right you live in a condo a 30-story building and you're in a parking garage you can't have 50 percent of the people have electric vehicles and, and they're all sitting there and the last thing is the dealers really don't understand how the uh, federal tax credits work, uh, the state credits work, as well as utility credits. Uh, it's very confusing. Uh, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, is very confusing. But the good news is OfferLogix is here to help. Uh, we have an uh, incredible API that is completely dynamic, uh, based on marital status, uh, based on household income, uh, and it calculates a penny-perfect payment directly uh, based on the zip code of where you live. Uh, so you know how to qualify uh, and what you do qualify for uh, based on your income and level. But, you know, if I was buying, uh, Brian, an EV today or electric vehicle. Right. And I recommend this to everybody. Uh, I, 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 have, I do not have an electric vehicle. But uh, let me tell you, if I was doing it, I would lease it. First of all, it's technology, number one. Uh, look how often people get rid of their computers, right? Every two, three years, you're always buying a right. new computer. Right. This is an electric vehicle. So it's all electric, just like a computer. Number one. Number two is you get the seventy five hundred dollar federal tax credit immediately off the cap cost reduction of that vehicle. So imagine saving twenty five to thirty dollars immediately off that lease immediately. Uh, and seventy five hundred dollars qualifies on every EV vehicle that is sold in the United States today. Uh, and if you really want to pay cash for it, lease it first. And then 30 days from now, call the bank and pay it off. And that way you get the $7,500 federal tax credit. Yeah. So 
So that's interesting. You know, I was talking to my buddy, Andy Wright from the Vinart dealer group, oh, yeah. and he, he was uh, telling me about the Ionic 5 SE. He said, look, if you buy it, you can't get the 7,500, but if you lease it, you get the 7,500. And I, I can't believe you're telling the exact same story. The leasing gets you that uh, discount plus other incentives. And you know what? Those uh, Hyundai cars are nice cars. Cool. Gorgeous cars. Now, I don't know if that goes 400 miles or not, 450 uh, on a charge. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that. But yeah, the, the Hyundai is a beautiful car. The Kia has a great car. I mean, I, I like all the EVs. I mean, they're, 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 you know, sexy. Let's just say, you know, you know, if you're into the electronic stuff, they're very sexy. They have great torque and stuff. And that's the other piece is they always promote how fast these are, like, you know, from zero to 60. But reality is most people don't really care from zero to 60. They just want to go from point A to B to get to, you know, get to work, get to the grocery store, to wherever they need to get to. Uh, so, you know, a lot, lot of issues. But uh, we'll see what happens, uh, you know, from from now until 2030, you know, next administration, if the Biden administration stays in or if there's a new administration that comes in in the next two years and see if they blow it up or not. You know, Aaron, one thing I want to talk about, just the technical piece of offer logic, because a number of people from the vendor community listen to my podcast. And since your company deals with technology providers, marketing providers, OEMs, um, because your API is so robust and rich in what it provides, um, part of a great digital retailing experience is uh, a soft pull that can know uh, what the current payoff on a vehicle is. I hate when digital retailing tools say, hey, enter in your payoff. Well, who 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 knows what your payoff is? You know what I mean? Like it, uh, that's why like digital retail kind of fails sometimes because you ask people uh, estimate your credit score or estimate your payoff. But with a soft poll, you can get that direct. And there's other people who offer soft polls. But I'd like your approach for people who are looking to make digital retail tailing really seamless um, to not guess on two important things, uh, their their credit quality and their current vehicle payoff. What do you do differently that makes your platform power uh, frictionless experiences? Yeah, yeah. Well, great question. So, well, first of all, everyone should, should know soft pools is, is a key ingredient to not only digital retailing platforms, but also desking and also showroom processes. Um, a lot of a lot of people don't realize that soft pools do not affect your you know any inquiry uh, on your credit report and does not lower your your FICO score. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that uh, yet. Uh, it's coming that way. Uh, people are now starting to become more educated in that. And but also the consumer, you know, believe it or not, Brian, most people now you're in the car business and I'm in the car business, but but most consumers, believe it or not, have no clue of what they qualify for for from uh, from a you know, for us, tier one credit or from a tier seven credit, you know, whatever it is. Uh, most consumers have no idea what their credit score is. Uh, and now, now the other piece of the puzzle is the other piece that a lot of consumers don't understand and dealers and, and you and I don't educate the world greatly is they don't understand all the different auto scores. Like there's auto score eight, there's auto score nine, you know, then mortgage has their own scores and, and so forth. And a lot of people just realize that there's all these different types of scores out there for FICO. So what exactly is it uh, at the end of the day? So what we do is we make offering a credit perfect payment through Equifax and we're powered through Equifax. Uh, it took us a long, hard time to negotiate that agreement. Uh, and what we do is we go to 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 the digital retailing companies so they do not need to sub it out to a one of the third parties that are out there today i'm not going to mention the third parties out there but there are about three three other companies in the in the auto space subbing it out and they basically own now listen they own the customer they own the dealership so basically at the end of the day a digital retailing platform signs up with one of the third parties that are out there that resell soft credit pools and then they actually contact the dealership they credential them. And then basically, if they have any other services from there, they upsell them and they do everything. You don't own any of that business at the end of the day. At Offer Logics is you still own the customer. We do all the credentialing for you. So you don't have to do the credential. Like we verify that's a real dealership. We get the driver's license from the dealer principal. We do all that. But you own the customer. 
and we sell it to you at a wholesale cost. So we call it a cost plus model and where you can mark it up and make a great 40 to 50, maybe even 70% margin on every soft credit pool that you do uh, at that dealership level through your digital retailing platform, through your desking platform or your showroom process or equity mining. A lot of people are now doing an equity mining. Uh, they're adding the soft credit pools right within equity mining. Hey, give us your first name, last name, see what you qualify for. And it automatically figures out a credit perfect payment using our API. That's the difference between us and the third parties. Hopefully I explained that correctly. Oh, well, I, I, I think what you're doing is working because, um, Without name dropping, some of the most powerful automotive retailing platforms and uh, market personalization uh, companies are are being powered by OfferLogic. You know, Aaron, when you look at the future, um, payments, you know, as you mentioned, are significantly higher as people go to trade in their cars or do their lease and uh, upgrade. Uh, you know, the, the experts are thinking that interest rates shouldn't stay this high this long, especially going into an election cycle. There's some politics associated with that. But it's clear that um, the cost to own a car is taking, uh, I love the car dealer guy who's on uh, X uh, platform talking about how many weeks of someone's salary it now uh, represents to to buy a new car. What do you think our industry has to do to make cars more affordable? Is it is it going to be longer leasing terms? Is you know you you see with the strike, um, people are saying, or at least the big three are saying that if a uh, met the demands of the UAW, it would add another five thousand dollars to every vehicle that are already very expensive. That they wouldn't be able to electrify their fleet because they're losing money already on building EV cars. Um, you see all of this come together because at the end of the day, you're powering accurate payments. What what do you look at the future of affordability for vehicles? Because there seems like EVs are more expensive. The UAW wants more, you know, compensation yet. Does this mean the big three could be at a significant disadvantage and lose market share? What are you seeing? Well, if the strike continues on, they're definitely going to lose market share of the big three, uh, just because the domestics won't have any inventory while the imports uh, will start, you know, keep the imports, uh, the imports will keep producing vehicles and they'll start selling more cars and brand loyalty will suffer for the domestic just because leases are up, people can't get cars and so forth. But here's here's the reality. I think with the strike, I don't think prices are going to go up. I mean, think about this, Brian. All I mean, and, and, and our presidents, our current president said it, everyone knows it. All the OEMs are making massive amount of profit right now. They were making during COVID and right after COVID, they've been making more profit than they've ever made in their entire life. The reason that is, I mean, you think about this for a second, and most people don't think about this, and I see it real time on our dashboard, is that incentives, subvented rates, rebates, and incentives were not there. And that costs OEMs and captives a ton of money. The other piece of the par par party was they weren't doing all the marketing. Uh, they didn't have to market like they were before because people were just buying cars because they had no inventory, you know, two, three years ago. But now as things normalize, we're going back to the way it used to be. Um, you know, especially with imports, because imports are still going to have to start uh, uh, subventing vehicles, adding more rebates. So they're going to be it costs the OEM tons of money, tons of money to get to market um, and and to produce you know what they want to sell. So if they want to sell the Toyota Tundra, they're going to have to put more money on it. If they want to sell the Honda Accord, they're going to have to put more money on it. Depending on what's sitting and what's not sitting, uh, they're going to have to do. But we also know the infrastructure for EVs too as well, that they're going to have to put a ton of money on those too. Because like you said earlier, they're sitting except for some parts of the United States. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think uh, at the end of the day, I, I see it that the, all the OEMs are going to start um, incentivizing, subventing their rates uh, in, a, in a massive way uh, just to keep market share and, and production going because they have to produce so many vehicles to keep their stock prices up and, and their profitability going. Well, it's going to be an interesting road ahead as we 
move uh, into some uncharted territory, but also um, some very familiar territory. Actually, I'm excited. I'm excited for Brian. I actually excited for all this because um, everybody wants payments now. I mean, it's yes. During COVID, it was like, oh, you know, digital retailing was there. But now you can't advertise a vehicle for buy, you know, buy this vehicle for fifty nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars. OK, great. What's the monthly payment on that? Exactly. Well, the monthly payment on that is seven eighty five. Oh, yeah, I can't afford that. Oh, how much the payment for forty nine thousand? Well, that, you know, that one is, you know, six six hundred eighty five dollars, you know. So payments are hot. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and we're getting a ton of demand for that currently at offer logics. And, and the cool thing is, is since you're integrated via API to marketing messages, um, dealers can send out emails, uh, have Facebook and Google campaigns, all reflecting, uh, accurate and consistent payments. And I think this is obviously a perfect storm for offer logics. Um, Aaron, if somebody wanted to learn more about your API, uh, maybe a developer at a company who's thinking about building some new consumer facing tools, what's the best website for them to go to? Yeah, the best website is offerlogics.com, O F F E R L O G I X.com. Uh, and, uh, or you can just look me up uh, right on uh, LinkedIn, Aaron Bickart on LinkedIn and uh, I'll and private message me and uh, I'll get right back to you as quickly as I can. Great. Well, um, dealers and members of the technology community should know that OfferLogix will be at the upcoming Modern Retailing Conference in Palm Beach. That's November 12th, 13th, and 14th. This is a uh, high energy conference talking about the latest challenges, solutions, and technologies for modern retail. Um, we're not covering the basics. We're covering the things that dealers will be using and depending on for their profitability in 2024. The event sells out every year. So go to modernretailingconference.com, check out the agenda, book your rooms at the beautiful O Hotel. And this way you'll have an opportunity to uh, sit down, have a glass of wine, talk to Aaron and his team on how they can power the next generation of automotive retailing solutions. If this is the first time you've been listening to one of my podcasts, you should know that I have dozens of interviews with industry leaders, um, people who are transforming automotive retail and, well, delivering an elevated customer experience like the team here at OfferLogic. So just search for the Brian Pash podcast on your favorite player. Aaron, are you looking forward to MRC in beautiful Palm Beach this November? Oh, absolutely. We That's absolutely one of our favorite shows to go to, Brian. Uh, our team uh, will be there in great spirit uh, with uh, full and full force. And uh, we love everybody there, the energy, the people. Uh, also, also all the collaboration. Um, the collaboration and networking is unbelievable, too, as well. So uh, it's one of the best events in the auto industry, and we give it a five star out of five star. All right. Well, Aaron, thank you so much. And I want to thank you for listening today to today's interview. This is one of a series of interviews uh, highlighting the speakers and the companies that will be featured at the Modern Retailing Conference. So hope to see you in Palm Beach this November. And until next time, have a great day and get ready for another exciting interview on the Brian Pesh podcast series. 